now talking about the basic economic problem. To, to conceptualize the basic economic problem, you begin by looking at what are all of your wants? What are all the wants that, that people have? And so if I were to make a list of the things that I want, you know, I want to buy a new guitar, I want to buy a new computer, I want to take holiday, I want to do any number of things. If you, if you gave me a list, I could, I could write out a hundred of them, right? Uh, these are all things which would be quite nice to do, which would give me, you could say, utility. You could, they, they give me, uh, they, they're useful to me, right? Now, I've got this problem because I've got all these wants, and you can think, you know, which is the most important, um, you know, which, which have the highest opportunity cost, something like that. Um, and you could also think about it in terms of utility. Utility is this economic concept that describes the usefulness of a product. So if I say that, you know, if I wanted to play guitar and I wanted to get a, a brand new guitar, I could describe that in terms of utility. It might be some random number out of 10. You say, oh yeah, like this gives me utility seven out of 10 to, to, to have a new guitar, but going on a holiday would give me maybe utility of eight out of 10, so, something like that. When, it, when economists look at the idea of utility, it just describes that, that general idea of usefulness, how useful is something to you. So, the, the way that we can, can pose this problem is to say, you know, what should we do with this land? You know, I, I've, got a, I've got a speck of land here uh, on the north coast of Cornwall. Um, you know, currently it's fields. And what, what sorts of things could we do with this land? You know, I, unless we would, have, we would pose this question, like, well, let's make a list. And people come up with lots of different ideas. They say, I want to make, you know, like um, luxury houses. I want to put on a car park. I want to put on an airport, maybe a helipad if, if it's big enough. I want to put on a business park. I want to put on, I want, I want to keep it as fields. Um, there are any number of things that you could do with this land. And what the economic problem suggests is that there only, there's only so much land and you can't do everything you would want to do with it. You, you, you can't build the car park and the luxury flats and keep it as, as farmland and, and put the helipad in. Um, eventually, there, there are just too many competing ideas of what to do with this land. And so in economics, we think, how can we then allocate this land um, in a way that, that works? How, how can we come up with, uh, with a system which says the, all, all these scarce resources, all these scarce little bundles of land, we're going to allocate them and, and, and share them out um, among, amongst the, um, many different purposes. And, and, and come up with, with, with a way of allocating that. And so that's really what the basic economic problem is. It says that resources have to be allocated between competing uses, between wants, which are infinite, um, while resources are scarce. So that's the idea that, like I said, I've got this, this list of 100 things that I would really like to have, but my resources, in order to be able to produce them, are scarce. I've only got so much land that, that I can actually use to to, to build something on. And so therefore economics, uh, uh, the, the fundamental question of economics is how do we then divide that piece of land up in order to make sure that, that, that we're producing the right thing and how, and, how do, and how do we reach that. So the key thing to this is that, you know, like, you know, our wants are infinite, we're all greedy, we all want things, um, but our resources are scarce. There's not enough to go around. And so we've got to figure out a system to dish out what there is. That's what we mean by saying that resources have to be allocated. I put this, this picture of this, of this toddler in here um, because if anybody knows a toddler, toddlers often want to have it all ways, right? They want to do everything and it's very difficult for them to understand that no, you can't, um, you can't go to the park and go to the beach and go to the soft play and do everything all at once because they want to do everything all at once. So in economics, it's, it's actually about saying what do you want to do most and making sure that we do that thing first and, um, and, and dividing up those resources in in an effective way. So how do individuals decide? Well, the way that I would think about this is to look at, say, a property which is for sale. And this property, at the time I made this PowerPoint, would have been on right move. This is a property in New Key, overlooking Fiscal Beach. It's a two-bedroom apartment for sale, and it costs 325,000 pounds, was the guide price on this property. I'm not sure if it's sold yet. Um, so what factors of production go into this property? Um, you know, you can think about the factors of production, you know, the, the land upon which the apartment buildings were built, the, the, the capital, I suppose, would be the actual building itself and all the furniture within the building. The labor would be the, the people who, who, who built it, you know, 
the, the craftsmen, the builders, who actually um, put the thing together. And, uh, and the enterprise would be whoever, I guess, put the risk in developing it, put, put some money forward in order to have this, this property developed. And so how do we decide who gets this? And that's what we talk about when we say the key to the economic, key to the economic problem. Do we just say, right, it goes to the highest bidder, anybody who can afford to pay the 325? Um, or do we, do we say that you have to be on a waiting list, or does it have to go to a local person? Um, that's, that's really what we're trying to get at with the economic problem in terms of choices for society. Um, and, and, and how the individual society, in this case, I would imagine that would go to whoever can pay the most for it. Uh, this is a, a cool video. I'll put the link up to it. It's about the invisible hand, this idea that, um, that Adam Smith had, which was to do with, with the price mechanism within the market, which says that in, in, in allocating resources, a market system will allow the price mechanism to, to to guide people to what things that they should be able to buy and, and, um, and what things should be sold. And we'll talk about that a bit more when we look at markets and market equilibrium. Um, but it, it's a pretty cool explanation, which is certainly worth a look at. And this is also another uh, cool video which explains the idea about the invisible hand because, because the, the invisible hand is, is, is the market mechanism working to allocate resources to saying, okay, well, if it costs this much, then we should put the price at this much, which means that whoever can afford it um, should be able to buy, say, that piece of property. Um, so yeah, so, that, so those two things describe this, the invisible hand, and the commonly used phrase in economics, coined by Adam Smith, um, as I said, describes how the price mechanism um, incentivizes, uh, rations, and signals consumers and producers to an allocation of resources. So going back to, to, to this one here, what, what the invisible hand would do is it would say that the, 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 the price is 325,000, and so therefore that may mean that the person next door says, oh, you know, I, I think I'll take my property and build it into luxury flats because, um, because this, this high price makes me think, my goodness, I'd like to, I'd like to, to, to build this up, especially I'll, I'll take the resources which I have, say the land, and I will put forward some enterprise in order to build up my property and maybe sell it off into smaller plots because, because the price is telling me, it's incentivizing me to say, I would really like to have that property, or I'd really like to, to sell my piece of land um, to somebody who, who could be able to uh, afford to pay that high price for it. And it also signals to, to, to buyers to say, oh, well, you know, this is, this is how much it's going to cost, and so therefore, if, you know, if I wanted to have two of these flats, well, I certainly couldn't afford it, so maybe I'll, I'll only have the one. So therefore, the, the price function also rations how much people are able to, to, to purchase. Um, looking at this then, okay, so how do governments decide um, how scarce resources are allocated? Uh, so, so the factors of production that are associated with a hospital, you can think of, you know, it, it's the, the land upon which the hospital is built, the, 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 the building and the machines, the equipment would be the capital, the, the doctors, nurses, and technicians would be the labor, and I suppose the enterprise, to, some, to the extent that there is enterprises, again, in the UK, it being a, um, a publicly provided service free of charge, um, funded by the government, it, it's hard to say that there's, there's necessarily an enterprise there, but there is certainly a, an element of, of organization of these, of these resources. And the reason why I use this as an example is because governments do decide how it is that the resources should be allocated. In the UK, we decide that, that hospitals and healthcare should be free at the point of use, that people can walk in and they can, th there will be no, no price function on healthcare, uh, which is compared to other, other places in the world, say the United States, where, where it, it's all privatized. And so therefore, if you, if you want to access healthcare, you need to have health insurance, you need to be able to pay for it out of pocket. The reason why I put this up here is that it shows that different systems for allocating these resources will have very different impacts on how much it costs and how, and, and how much of a resource can be provided, uh, given the fact that the typical American birth costs as much as delivering a royal baby. This was something which came up in the news fairly recently, is that says the average normal delivery in the, in the United States costs over $10,000. And they compare that to the Lido wing, where I believe some recent royal baby was born, um, and that was the most expensive one in the UK. I think it came, came out like you know, just under $9,000, which is actually less 
than the average price of, of, of birth in the USA. And that is, that, that is a, a, a result of the fact that resources are allocated in very different ways. In the USA, the, the system for, for providing hospitals is, is based on a price system. It's based on a private enterprise system, which means that it's the, the, the outcomes which are decided are, are very different from the way that they are in the UK, where the, the, there's much more of, a, of an emphasis on cost minimization um, than, than there would be in, 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 the, in, in the USA system. Um, okay, one last point on this is to say, are all resources, quote, scarce? There's one example of a type of resource which you would say is not necessarily scarce. This is what you call a free good. And a free good definition, an important definition to get down, is that they are goods which are unlimited in supply and which therefore have no opportunity cost. In lesson, we would have gotten through some examples of what are free goods. But the, the examples I think are best to look at are things like seawater. Seawater I would classify as a, free, as a free good because you can use it to make salt. And so there, are, there is a salt company in Cornwall which pumps water out of the sea puts it through a process which then comes out with, with sea salt, which they market and sell. But when they take this resource out of the sea, there's, there's no opportunity cost to it, right? Because th they, they take the water out and it doesn't prevent anybody else from benefiting from this water. There's enough water in the sea, in other words, to say that if we take out this much to produce as much salt as we want, that it's not going to stop anybody else from, from using the ocean. It's not going to stop somebody from, 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 from sailing or, or from, from looking at, at the view. Um, there's no opportunity cost for this. The other thing that I would say is, is wind, not wind power, because wind power involves capital, which, which is scarce, but the wind itself, I think, is, is, is a free good, because it blows past, and you either have a blow past your house, blow past your property, and you think that was a, that was a bit of a blustery day, and it, 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 it's gone, right? Or you build a, a wind farm, and the wind farm is able to have the wind you know, harvest that good, and the, the, the wind generates the, the, the electricity. So therefore, the wind itself actually, as it passes by, there's no opportunity cost to that, as long as you put the capital together to actually um, put the, the wind farm up. It's not like the wind is going off and anyone's losing out because you've, you've taken that wind and converted it into power. Uh, so, so now is the time to, to pause, consolidate, and review. Is to say, can you look at and can you understand what it is that we mean by these? The basic economic problem: free goods, economic goods, the invisible hand, and um, and these are just some examples you can look at with the economic problem to say, how well do I do I understand this? Can I can I put these sorts of sorts of choices into a context which looks similar to the economic problem? 